Hello everyone. Um, so as uh, Sue said, I'm a civil engineer working for the London Borough of Enfield and I've, uh, myself and my colleague Graham here have come here today to tell you about a couple of projects that are ongoing um, that are at the larger end of the scale from a SUDS point of view. Um, first I'm just going to quickly outline what our general aims are at Enfield with respect to SUDS um, talk about you know, making them safe but also making sure they're nice places that people want to go to and enjoy. Um, mentioned maintenance briefly. Um, the case studies that we're going to use, uh, one of them is Pims Park Wetlands, which I'll be talking about, and the other one is First Farm Wetlands, which my colleague Graham will come on to. Um, I just wanted to put this up first because it outlines, you know, our strategy duty is to prepare a flood risk management uh, strategy, and one of the objectives of the strategy is to reduce runoff rates, but it's a flood strategy, it's not a placemaking strategy, but what we recognise as engineers and as, you know, from the council's point of view is that to make SUDS successful and to reduce runoff rates and achieve those flood benefits that we're looking for, we've got to make sure that SUDS um, can work well in public spaces and are, as I mentioned, are you know, nice places to visit and so on. And I've said we want to normalise SUDS there, so what we're doing there is we're trying to challenge the perception that SUDS are unconventional and you know, traditional pipe drainage is the way to go and SUDS are a kind of slightly unusual alternative, um, what we want to do is get as, in the short term, we're trying to get as many kind of SUDS retrofit schemes in the ground, in high profile places, town centres, parks, make them highly visible so that people can see them and actually, you know, come to see and understand what they are. Um, we did a, we had a stall at a recent um, event in Enf Enfield's country show and uh, we we were there for a couple of days and spoke to getting close to 100 people and uh, just random punters who happened to stop by and have a chat. But we did like a little poll on them just to see how many of them had actually heard of SUDS. And about a third of them claimed they'd heard of SUDS, but I think some of those were probably saying they had when they hadn't really. Um, so these are just some of the schemes um, that we've done. I mean, I think actually all of these were done within the last kind of 12 or 18 months. Um, some of them are in parks, some of them are in highways. But the schemes we're going to talk about are on a bigger scale. This, I'll just give you a little bit of information about the catchment itself. Um, so it's called Moor Brook, which is a, one of these kind of lost rivers. It's an historical name. We've got a map from 1867 which shows it as a kind of lovely natural watercourse running through rural countryside. Um, but as Enfield was developed largely in the early 20th century, it started to get piped in and disappear under concrete. And by the time we got to the 1950s, there was nothing left of it at all. Um, so that river, or culvertive watercourse now, um, outfalls into Pims Park Lake, which is in Edmonton. And this is a pretty horrific photo showing the impacts of urban uh, diffuse pollution on that water body. Um, another issue in that catchment is flood risk. Um, so really this map got the catchment outline and it's just showing the kind of fluvial flooding which is what we used to go by when I started working for Enfield Council. All we were concerned about was fluvial flooding primarily. Um, but then with the uh, Flood and Water Management Act we started to take an interest in service water flooding and the service water flooding there is the blue outline. So obviously within the catchment you've got no fluvial but lots of surface water. So we um, wanted to come up with a scheme that would address these issues and uh, having worked with Thames 21 and Robert Bray Associates over the last two or three years on um, a scheme to implement some sort of SUDS bioremediation or kind of uh, constructive wetlands techniques we identified that this catchment would be an ideal place to uh, extend that kind of concept. Um, the other thing about the catchment is and in Enfield generally is there's a lot of really large open spaces that are very underused. They're kind of parks nominally, but often they're just kind of green deserts that sometimes they've got football pitches and stuff like that in, but they've also got a lot of spaces around the edges that aren't really used for anything in particular. And uh, you know, they get the grass gets cut every two weeks or through the summer and that's just how they're treated basically. Um, so we identified a space about the size of a football pitch that was not really being used for anything in particular. Um, in order to create a wetland area there, we had to deculvert a section of that um, piped watercourse. We had to dig down three and a half metres, which sounds quite off-putting at first, but actually, you know, if you've got enough space, if you've got the width to manage it, then it's, it's achievable to 
create relatively shallow slopes. Um, obviously, you want to make sure it's safe. Um, so we've made sure the slopes are no steeper than one in three, and we've kept them shallower where possible. Um, and then we're using vegetation to create kind of natural barriers so that people don't, you know, throw themselves into the wetlands uh, too often. Um, in terms of making an interesting space, we've tried to create a network of paths around the wetlands um, and to create opportunities for people to experience different things. So there's some places where you can kind of look over the wetlands, some places where you can kind of get close to the water, you can hear it babbling away. Um, there's little pockets where we've kept small areas of open water where sort of uh, ducks and things will kind of splash around. And even though that scheme, uh, it's, I mean, that photo's from earlier this summer, as I say, it's just only recently been, not even now quite finished. Um, it's already generated a lot of interest from local people. Um, currently, it's all fenced off, and we're going to keep the fences in place for about a year or maybe a year and a half just until that vegetation is established fully. But from my experience of having visited the site, you know, it's, anyone walking past it before would have just, you know, wouldn't have paid any attention to it. Whereas now, you, you often notice there's people standing and just looking at what's going on. Um, in terms of the local residents, when we first proposed this idea, there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, people concerned about, is the water polluted? Is it dangerous? The public health issues and so on. Is it going to be too steep? Um, so we thought the best thing to do was take them on a trip to the Olympic Park wetlands and say, well, this is what you're going to get, more or less. Which would maybe raise their expectations somewhat, but we, you know, we wanted to get them on side, so that kind of worked quite well in the end. Um, we also made, you know, gave them opportunities to comment on the design and uh, have a genuine input into it. And also, we had a volunteer planting event in uh, May, so that's when the volunteers were planting the wetlands there. And then that next photo is taken just three months later, and you can see what a difference it's made. I mean, it's gone from looking like a quarry with a few weedy plants in it to looking like something that's relatively attractive. Um, but, you know, that really gave, obviously, the local residents a sense of ownership there. Um, that, oh, this is quite a good aerial photo that Google took for us. And uh, while the wetlands are down here, have just been constructed. So you can see that at that point, the signs were all still quite bare. You can see the lake down here. And then this area up here is where we got rid of all the spoil from that excavation. And um, that also allowed us to deliver a, a fringe benefit, um, which was to create two new football pitches. Because the football pitches at this site, there were about six of them. and they were kind of all like this, especially in the gold mouths and places like that. So we've managed to give them two really high quality four pitches that are kind of graded, graded to FIFA standard. So there we go. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that one of the other un ancillary benefits of SUDS is, as well as you know, the producing flooding and improving water quality and so on, is that it just by doing these kind of deculverting or wetland creation schemes, it actually allows people to realise that there actually is a water course there, which they wouldn't be aware of. And, you know, it's easy for us to kind of try and persuade people that we should be doing this sustainable drainage or this and that, but if you're saying to them, well, it will have a benefit on some river that's several miles away, then they're not going to be very interested. But creating features like this, which kind of engage people in conversation, raise awareness, you know, really helps to, to get people's interest up. So, Kim's Park, where this is down here, um, being at that bottom end of the catchment, all that flood storage we've created isn't really having a benefit on the flood risk upstream, so we identified a need to deliver another scheme, which is first farm wetlands, which is what my colleague Graham's going to work Thanks. Hi there, hi. Um, yeah, so first farm was actually further up in the catchment around here. Is it? No, it's about there. Oh, it's big space. Yeah, it's that big space <laughs> up there. So, We've got an aerial photography view of it there. Um, so this area was identified for um, as to provide further water quality benefits, really, um, up in the catchment. And you can see here, it's mainly dedicated to football pitches. It's a huge open space, 21 hectares. And you can see where the football pitches are there. Um, and also a lot of um, people walking dogs on the site. But really, it was pretty featureless, apart from a bit of woodland and the rest of it but we knew there was um, a culvert running through the site for the Moor Brook um, which you can just about see the outline of at the northern strip um, up there up here um, and really that we saw that as an opportunity 
but really the whole site was underused given the local population, the housing density around there. Enfield is quite lucky that a lot of green open spaces, a lot of parks and people do use them but this one was particularly underused. I think mainly it was just people arriving at the weekend playing football, sort of chucking a litter and going home and then people walking dogs and there wasn't really much character to the space. So the idea is to, um, it's currently being constructed at the moment, but it's to create a new public open space, only really utilising 10% of the existing site. And that's to be achieved through diverting a culverted watercourse into um, 400 square metres of wetland um, and some open watercourse. Um, it's also providing 30,000 cubic metres of flood storage through a bund at the downstream end of the site and within the wetlands themselves. Uh, I think in total we're looking at uh, half a kilometre of new open water course in terms of the stream as well as the wetlands. Um, and 600 metres of cycleways and footways throughout the, throughout the site as well. So it's going to dramatically alter the site really and give a bit more of an amenity space. Now it was it's been designed in-house at Enfield um, and constructed by carefully selected contractors, obviously. Um, but we didn't want it to just be something we just sort of design and implement and then walk away from. And we've been quite lucky in that a friends group has been formed at the park. Um, really, at the time, we didn't have much knowledge of the people in the area, um, but since we had the idea inception a little over a year ago, the friends group have really picked it up and run with it and got involved and, and really taken ownership of the space. But we've used sort of um, methods such as putting signs up around the site with, with uh, visualisations like this um, and publishing consultation documents with our sort of ideas within them and allowing people to comment. So both on the website and through um, stalls at local events and things like that where they've sort of taken that and gone and done it themselves um, and consultation events on the site themselves as well I think that event took place exactly a year ago today or maybe yesterday I think it was 1st of October because I remember it being October and we did it in the, in the evening just it was getting dark and we were taking down the marquee in the dark and a few people at the council were a bit worried about that but, um, yeah so that was on the site and that that was just after phase one where we construct we we dug out the um, watercourse. Um, so there was already some sort of visualisation going on there. People could see what was going on. But that was to get people's ideas about what we could do next. So at the beginning, when we first started, as I say, the friends group was in its infancy. They didn't really have people a bit nearby to this big green open space. But they didn't have something to inspire them. There was no sort of tangible feature to the site which gave them something to, to uh, get attached to if you like. So since we um, sort of brought this scheme to fruition, um, they've, they sort of really have, as I say, run with it. They've contributed ideas through the consultation and informally um, over things like where we're going to have con um, congregation areas, benches and things in the site. Um, they've publicised the scheme locally um, to in order to get funding from the GLA through the Big Green Fund. Um, we've also had, I should say, we've had financial streams from um, Thames Water, the Environment Agency and the GLA. Really should have put all their logos on the, on the presentation but haven't, so I'll mention them there. Um, and also Thames 21 have worked with the Friends Group as well. Thames 21 are a local waterways charity. Many of you may have heard of them, you may not have, but they've really worked with, with the Friends Group, got to know them on a personal level. Um, and assisted in the community engagement and the planting events, similar to at Pims Park, where we've had corporate um, volunteer days. So they've taken staff from banks and things like that who volunteer to go on a corporate uh, volunteer day and come and do planting at the site. And also having separate events at the weekend for the, for the general public to come and plant as well. And that's been going on recently. Uh, and Thames 21 are also doing water testing um, of the site as well, so water quality testing. So the Friends Group, they've, as I say, they've become a real entity. They've got 
their own logo, work with Thames 21. Friends Group have got a website which is always kept up to date. Um, there's one particular, sort of the, you might say the leader of the Friends, but the, the, um, a, le a lady who lives locally who's really sort of garnered local support. And as well as Thames 21, they've arranged these planting days at the site and they've been out in all sorts of conditions, as have we. Um, but yeah, you see there's come rain, come shine, really, to plant the uh, skiing. Um, the Friends have also have an initiative to adopt a tree on the site, so there's newly planted trees, and they encourage people to adopt a single tree and then be responsible for its maintenance and upkeep. Um, and I think that, that sort of idea it's something we, we've obviously gone and constructed the scheme design constructed and they've sort of taken it on and done that themselves um, and that's just really sort of getting the public uh, motivated to do that sort of thing I think that would extend to things like litter picking and things like that and general maintenance of the site um, so I think that's quite a, quite a good uh, feature so just to show you go through the scheme as it's being constructed um, as I say, it is still in construction at the moment. We've just just coming to be doing phase two at the moment, which is the main wetlands. But this was back in March, so you can see the, the sort of site we had to start with. It is you see it's quite vast. That is only a very small portion of the site where we didn't actually have sports pitches, but we did have the culvertive watercourse running under there. So say you've got a watercourse there, and people walking along in the site would know nothing about it whatsoever. So the first uh, part of the scheme was. To was to form a new watercourse <coughs> into which we can divert the, the culvert. And then using spoil from that first phase, we constructed a flood uh, protection bund at the downstream end of the site. So there's erosion control going in and dressed with topsoil. And then we obviously had a watercourse. Now, we haven't actually, uh, I don't know if it's a technical term, we haven't actually plumbed it in yet. To the culvert, we haven't connected the culvert into the watercourse, but because it's a it's a mixture of gravel and clay at the site, so it's it's self-lined if you like, but it's already got water in it, which is groundwater. So we've all, I think if we just dug it and there was no water in there, it'd be a bit of a, it'd be even more bald and and raw. But it's um, because of the water that's already there, it's given it some uh, character already, and so obviously that's just as after it had been dug out and then a bit of planting from the planting days. So that's still early days, so that will all hopefully spring up. And phase two began in July, which was the uh, wetland construction. So that's the contractors getting involved there, taking the topsoil out. And then it's quite daunting when you start doing that because you've suddenly just got huge, you're constructing the wetlands and you've got a big open, almost quarry, uh, quite muddy as well. So there we are, it's taking shape there. And then he's taking us up to sort of almost last week, these photos. <coughs> Part of the pathway there, the new path going through the site, and then the planting going in. So you can see here, the people that live locally have really got something to start working with. As we're talking about placemaking, that's you know, quite, quite relevant. Now, brace yourself, these are some photos that we're quite proud of, um, of just showing how the area has transformed. So obviously you've got houses there. Let's go back and show you that again. And then another one, it's a block of flats at the back there which have a great view over the site and lots of people there are really happy about it because I think at one point this area was, there was discussion for housing. As you can imagine, the council may have been willing to sell it off for housing but obviously the flood risk ruled that out completely and now what we've done is probably uh, kibosh that idea altogether so that shows the new view there so just an idea that we sort of had the other day Ian and I just gone to a, a sort of management um, conference and sort of took sort of came out slightly ridiculed some of the ideas, but we actually took this idea from it, so it's a bit tongue-in-cheek. But it's showing, I'm sure everyone here can imagine, getting sub schemes across to members of the public and sometimes even colleagues can be quite, quite arduous. So here we've got sort of time and perception 
uh, people's perception of the scheme. And people's ideas can change as you sort of develop them, develop the schemes, I should say. So people start off saying, well, what we've got does the job, whether it's the drainage or space in, it, in itself. They're happy with a given space. And when we first started consulting on First Farm as well, people were saying, oh, we like the large open space. But, you know, we had to say that we're only, we're only doing this to 10%. You're still going to have a large open space on the rest of the site. Um, and then people sort of move into, we don't really understand why we need this, and sort of pure outrage sometimes. <laughs> and then as the scheme progresses and com as is constructed, then people's ideas start to, start to uh, be a bit more positive. And you can see there, people, that's the sort of thing we get at First Farm, you know, at the moment, which is positivity. <coughs> we do have a scheme just down, just about a mile away from First Farm, very lodge wetlands which uh, is a bit different in its scenario in that it's uh, an ex-council depot which has been sold off. Part of it is being used for housing and it's next door to a current sort of park. We've been given the task of developing part of it, not the old park, but the old depot into some new wetlands. So there's already a friends group attached to the existing park and they're quite against anything we want to... We're proposing to do and we're proposing basically a similar sort of wetland scheme there with suds it's a bit more of a constrained site but initially when we went to them with the idea the friends group have been really resistant to it um oh yeah sorry this is i've just i've learned a lot about powerpoint doing this yeah. <coughs> that shows how people's ideas move as, as the uh, scheme progresses so very lodge is sort of as I say, different, different sort of scheme, but very close to First Farm. We've had a very different reception from the public in relation to it. Um, and in fact, I think I was in this room when Paul came and said, what have you done to upset the Enfield Independent? Because the Friends Group actually went to the Independent when we started uh, doing the prep work at the site, sort of claiming we decimated it. So Berry Lodge is sort of at that end of the scale at the moment. Pim's Park, as I say, that was already a very well-used park in a in an area where the park is, is quite developed. And the Friends Group are also quite sort of entrenched in their ideas. So we're getting them to sort of p to be mobilised by, by um, the scheme we did there. It was a bit of an uphill struggle, but I think we're moving up at the moment as it's now being put into the ground and started, the plants starting to mature very quickly. People have taken a bit more of a liking to it. And First Farm has been a bit of an easy one, really, because the Friends Group, say, was in its infancy and it gave them something to get involved in. Um, so they're sort of up at that end of the scale. And it's important to emphasise that this doesn't apply to all people. Some people you know, do like the scheme, but it's often the people that shout the loudest that you, that you hear more. Um, and if it's negative, then you sometimes have to sort of shimmy them along a bit. So maybe the next scheme starts there and we'll just move through it again. So I'll just show you some of the, this is a bit sort of, have I got news for you, the headlines for Berry Lodge, but then we've also had positive headlines in uh, the local papers for First Farm and Pims Park. <laughs>